Raise your hand if you heard Andy Hargraves way back in San Antonio when we had a conference there. Just a few of us are still, remember how funny he was? We could not quit laughing. Well, fun, the British accent's fun, but he is just remarkably humorous. But here's why he's here. He may be, in terms of content, the most important person in our field right now. He is so focused on doing the right things for kids and not just testing. In fact, you'll hear him talk about testing. In fact, let me tell you this. He just got a huge grant in Canada from the Lego Foundation focusing on play in school and learning. He gets it that in order to be successful in a school, you have to be your top 20 self, and that's not going to happen if all you're doing is teaching math. You have to teach kids, and that's very different. I could go on and on about Andy and tell you about his resume, which is remarkable, but you have one of his books in hand now, or you'll get it after the session, Five Paths of Student Engagement, and you'll see how remarkably valuable that book is going to be. Without further ado, please welcome a Canadian to the United States. Yay, Andy! Yay! Oh, that feels so good, doesn't it? I feel good! Okay, <laughs> sounds great. This is my first large presentation to any real person in almost two years. <laughs> you know, any of you who've been there, you know, perhaps you went away, you were in the military. Perhaps. Perhaps you had a baby. Actually, being in the military is easier. Perhaps you had a baby. You took time off, took a couple of years off. Then you come back and you think, is it still there? Do I still have it? Am I rusty? How will I know? Well, at the end of the next hour and a bit, I guess, <laughs> I guess we're all going to find out, you know, one way, one way or the other. Because I have spent two years talking into the dark vortex of Zoom with no idea what people are thinking or how they're feeling, telling jokes, no idea whether people are laughing. If I'm trying to make people cry, I've no idea whether to cry. I've no idea what's going on. And if it's hard for me as an adult working with adults, just how hard has it been for all of you? working with kids and trying to, get, tr trying to get those magic moments that it's so hard to get on a screen. Not impossible, but so hard to get through technology. So we've seen some hard things during the time of virtual school and at-home learning. We've seen kids struggle. We've, we've looked into kids' homes, poor kids, and been shocked by what we've seen that they've revealed to us. And we've also seen some outrageously weird things at the same time. Have we not? Okay, so uh, my kids, my grandkids, were in virtual school for about 15 months. My wife's a former school principal. She spent every single day, every single hour with them on virtual school. And I kind of came in and out while I was doing these other things as well. And, and we saw things, we saw things like, when it comes yoga, okay? So there's a yoga break in the middle of class. Bit of a body break, bit of yoga. But my seven-year-old twin girls don't like yoga all that much, particularly when it's on the screen. So they'd much rather get down and wrestle on the floor with each other instead while yoga's going on. And you think, should we stop them? Well, actually, it's exercise. You know, they're, they're wrestling. Like, like, let them get on with it, basically. And then, like, very early on during the pandemic, when we got parents who were getting involved and a few parents who were getting a bit too involved, right? Did you say, and this is weird, like never before in history 
In history, have we had millions of parents across the world watching teachers teach every day. Every, and you're not always on your A game when they're doing it. But, but boy, they're glad they're not doing it now, and you are instead. Any, anybody who thought you could replace teachers with technology and do all the learning at home, we didn't need schools anymore. I think a lot of people have changed their mind right now, don't you? Because kids need to go to school so the parents can go to work. I mean, it's pretty basic, it's pretty basic stuff. So very early on during the pandemic, we, you know, I was watching my, my nine-year-old grandson and then, and then there was a parent hovering in in uh, one of the other kids, just trying to help them a bit. They were struggling a bit. And then the teacher said to the parent, while all the other parents were watching, the teacher said to the parent, excuse me, are you in this class? <laughs> right? Excuse me, are you in this class? Very weird. And then, uh, again, early on in the pandemic, I was a very good friend of Sir Ken Robinson, who sadly uh, passed away now. And I was going to record a video with him, uh, an online uh, video cast. It's actually the last thing he did before he was, before he was taken ill. And before I went, I said, look, I'm, I'm going to chat to this guy who's got like, 18 million viewers on YouTube about whether technology is a good idea with virtual school. So I said to my grandson, who's nine, what are the good and the bad things about te learning with technology? And I said, well, the good thing is, is you can leave class and your teacher can't stop you. <laughs> That's a really great thing. So, uh, for the next couple of minutes, just to kind of warm up, keep your, keep your proper social distancing, keep your masks on. I'm not going to come anywhere near you. Uh, I'm clean, I'm, I am Canadian, so I'm slightly dangerous, but I am, I am clean at the same time. Uh, but, but just have a chat to one person on your table. What is one of the, I'm not going to ask you to share it with the whole group, what is one of the weirdest, funniest, most bizarre things you experienced with kids, and it might have been virtual school, it might have been socially distanced learning, anything at all, weirdest, funniest, strangest thing you experienced during the whole pandemic, and take about a minute and a half each and share that, then we'll come back. This is, many of you know it already, this is, we'll be doing a few of these uh, in this session. So, uh, normally, in a normal masked, unmasked world, uh, what I would have you doing at one or two points is getting up and moving around. And uh, this is, by the way, a perfect room for a jigsaw, because if you give every row a number and every column a letter, thank you, uh, you can jigsaw people really fast. You can jigsaw them that way, and then you can jigsaw them that way, and then you can jigsaw them again. And it, it is so uh, a rectangular room on a grid. You, you can do a thousand people with, with jigsaw, and it's as easy as doing it with 30. So just think about that in the, in the future. But we can't do that today. So um, I'm gonna have like short conversations. Uh, with people at your table, and a couple of times I'm going to ask you to stand up and talk to somebody on the table next to you whilst keeping your, your masks on and your proper distancing. Um, there won't be much feedback to me uh, because you've all got your masks on, you'll be hard to hear, and uh, I have a hearing impairment these last few years, and I forgot to bring my recharger for my hearing device, which, which, which is a shame because not only can I not hear you, but I can't get my iPod and my music and, my, and everything else I get through these awesome hearing devices that I've, that I've got now. So this is what we'll do, okay? They, during the pandemic, early on, Education Week did uh, a survey of uh, teachers and asked them what they were concerned about. And 30% of the respondents, this is quite early, this is about May 19, 2020, uh, said they were really worried that the kids were losing engagement. 
They were less engaged than they were uh, before. Uh, probably, probably, and my PowerPoint slides have just gone. They're here, but they're, they're, there they are. Yeah, so there we go. So, so they're worried that the kids were losing engagement. And I suspect as, as, as the pandemic went on, that 30% figure got a lot worse, right? I'm sure you saw it in all kinds of ways. Kids of every age, kids of every age struggling to keep engaged with learning on screen, online for hours, or not, or not, uh, every, every day. But kids were already disengaged before the pandemic. Let's, uh, and actually, so, some, some kids got better during the pandemic. Some kids were more well, uh, kids with ADHD, kids who could walk around, kids who could hold a stuffy while they were learning instead of having it, you know, banned as, a, as, a, as an evil thing that they had uh, on their lap. Uh, kids who used to be, kids who were bullied and now, and now weren't bullied, they were safe at home. So, so some kids actually did, uh, not, not most, but some kids actually did better during the pandemic. A lot of kids were disengaged and not well before the pandemic. So here's a question for you. Are you ready? This is, uh, this is another quick one. I'm just going to ask you to think for about 30 seconds, and then I'm going to ask you to raise your hands in response. So the question is this. Uh, kids in your school... So, you know, be honest, don't, there's no shame here, and there's no pride either. Uh, so, what percentage of your kids do you think are engaged? What percent of them are disengaged, you know, not, not, not engaged? And what percent of them are actively disengaged, which means not only are they tuning out, but they're making life difficult for you and everybody else? So, r roughly, roughly what do you think? I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to like think of a number. And then I'm going to ask you for some answers. Okay. All right. Let's take let's just take number two. So how many of your kids are you feel like a lot of the time, not just we're all disengaged some of the time, right? But how many of them are disengaged like a lot of the time? Um, if you think it's, so here we go. Um, if, if you think it's about 70%, could you raise your hands? Yeah, thank you. 60. So you'll be pleased when I'm going down the other way, right? 60. Yeah, a few. 50. So half your kids are often disengaged. 40. Yeah, a few again, thank you. 30. Uh, 20. Less than 20. Okay, so quite a spread across all those. Uh, so here's three sets of figures. ASCD, before the pandemic, not long before, did uh, a survey of kids all across America and, and it found about 40 odd percent of kids were often disengaged, often bored in school. Uh, the older the kids get, the more likely it is to happen. So, you know, when the, when the kids are younger, they're engaged more often. When more, the more they get through to junior high, high school, the more disengaged that they tend to become. And it's just kind of, uh, and they have a lot of distractions, like, you know, hormones. And so you've you got, you got to work against those and technology and, and other things. So the Zenith survey of different countries by the OECD, the numbers aren't so depressing. They're about 20 to 30% depending on the country, depending on where you are. But, you know, if a fifth of your kids are often disengaged, that's a lot of kids and that's a lot of loss. Uh, here's a Gallup poll uh, that was done again just before the pandemic. And uh, this is what the Gallup poll is saying. So about 43%. So Gallup and ASCD in the US are similar sort of figures. Canada's not quite as high, but uh, that's really the scale of the problem that we're dealing with. So t today we're going to look at engagement, uh, why, why it's important. Uh, what, what your SAM process does, 
which is a great process, is it releases your leaders to be in classrooms and to see what's going on. And part of what's going on is, you know, are the standards on the board? Are the kids fixing their eyes on the teacher? Are they engaged? So the question is not only how do we get the kids engaged more often, but also what does engagement look like when you see it? And it's not as straightforward as it sounds. Like if I look like this, am I, am I engaged or not engaged? I got my mask off now, it's easier. If I look like this, am I surprised or have I had Botox? If I look like this, am I cross with you? Or am I concentrating? Because this is what Charles Darwin said people do when they're concentrating. They furrow the brows like they used to do when they were hunting for game to screen out the light so that they can focus. And when, you know, when I was dating my wife in the university, we've been married almost 50 years now. Yeah, yeah, uh, oh, uh, congratulate her, not me. Okay. So um, almost 50 years now. And uh, when we were dating at first, she often looked like that. And, and I thought she was cross with me. And sometimes she was, right? But, but usually she was just concentrating. So with engagement, very important, what you see is not always what you get. I'm going to tell you about a project we've done where most of this research comes from in the Pacific Northwest, where we work with five states and educators in five states in a network of over 30 schools. They got a bit of federal money to improve student achievement for the rural poor. By the way, a lot of America's poor is rural. It's rural. Uh, some of it is white. It's white rural and poor and disadvantaged and needs addressing. And some of it is um, immigrant to uh, Hispanic farm workers. And some of it is indigenous communities. There's many kinds of poor. There's many kinds of working class. Working class has many colors. Look at our essential workers. Look at our bus drivers. Look at our hospital cleaners. Many colors of being working class. The words working class in America and anywhere else should not be words that divide people against one another. They should be words that unite people with one another in a common struggle for a better opportunities and a better world together. So. So, so they're rural. And you know, one thing when you build a network is you have to decide, there's all kinds of things you have to do when you help people build a network. How big should you be? Who's in? Who's out? How fast should you grow? Um, how are you going to be sustainable once the money's gone? You need to discuss all these things early when you start. There's a couple of other things you need to discuss, and one of them is what are we going to focus on? So they decided they focus on student engagement. That's why we wrote a book on student engagement. We followed them. They didn't follow us. We, this is what they wanted to do. We worked with them. So I had to read a lot of stuff uh, on engagement to work with them and see, and see what they were doing. Because they believed correctly that engagement is a lever for student achievement and a window into well-being. If the kids aren't well, it's either there's something wrong at home or with the friends or there's something wrong with, with their studying and their time in school, one or the other, sometimes both. So they thought engagement was the key thing. And the other thing they thought you have to do with the network is you have to decide what you're going to do. Now, by the way, sharing practice isn't enough. If you just share practice, the evidence is it will have minimal impact on student achievement. You sit and you talk, you share some practice, and then you go away and you do nothing, mainly. You have to do some things, and they have to have a, a product, a result. What are you going to do? Are you going to look at each other's classes? Are you going to do lesson studies? Are you going to give feedback to each other? Or in this case, where are they going to design engaging units of work together? So twice a year, face-to-face, -face, and online in between, they would connect kindergarten teachers with kindergarten teachers, math teachers with math teachers. By the way, they were a very weird group. The math teachers. 
They're, they're kind of slow to go, because, you know, they're not great talkers. They're really not. They're not great talkers. They're a bit skeptical, but they collaborate in their own way. And they came up with, in the end, how to get the kids engaged with math, including teachers who didn't like to teach math. Because they're in small rural schools. They really wanted to teach something else, but math ended up on their teaching load, whether they liked it or not. So they meant to, and it took them a long time to get going, including 50-year-old guys who hated teaching math and didn't even like the kids very much, right? But eventually they got going and they created escape boxes, metal escape boxes with combination locks that could open in different ways. And you had to solve equations in order to open the combination locks. And suddenly they were excited and playful. Math teachers, being play you can play in maths, okay? Being playful with each other. And one of these 50-year-old guys stood up in front, of, in front of 200 people after about a year said, I used to hate teaching maths. I didn't want to teach it. I was a bad maths teacher. And now I'm a good maths teacher because I am engaged with maths, not just with teaching maths, but I am engaged with maths. It is engaging for me, and now I can make it engaging for my kids. This is what they did. And then, hands up if you're an administrator. Welcome. In a minute, you're going to be looking at your shoes, OK? Probably. Whenever there's a difficult moment, we always become fascinated by what color our shoes are. You know, we look down and think, my God, my shoes are so interesting now. I'd much rather look at these than look at anybody else. Because when these groups got together, the fastest group in terms of deciding what they would do were the administrators. And after the first day, Everybody else I was working with said, isn't it great? Aren't the administrators doing well? They've come up with like a plan and a vision and what they're going to do with the teachers and so on. I said, yeah, yeah, it is. False dawn. False dawn. You know what I mean by that? Okay, false dawn means, means the, you think the sun's up, but it's not really. It just looks like it is, okay? That's a false dawn. I said, just wait a while. What the administrators were concentrating on was not what they were going to do differently, but what they were going to make other people do things differently. And eventually they came across that obstacle. And then they became the slowest group. And then when they met at lunchtime, they thought the most important thing to do was to talk about the football games in their schools, rather than what was going on with teaching and learning. And they looked at their shoes a lot more until they got going, and then one of them said, let's create an observation instrument for seeing whether the kids are engaged. So when we go in, we'll have rough agreement on what we're, what we're seeing. So they did. They created an observation schedule with lots of criteria, and then they got some videos of classrooms, and then they rated them independently. Zero agreement between them. Zero. They had no idea whether the kids were engaged or not. Actually, worse, they thought they had an idea whether the kids were engaged or not, but really they didn't. And the result of that was fantastic conversation amongst them about how to, other than simple cues like, are they awake? Are they asleep? Are they there? Are they not there? Do they have their eyes on the teacher? Do they not? Are they looking out the window, not looking out the window? Other than simple stuff like that, like, how do you know? And you can't tell just by walking into a classroom for three minutes and then leaving again. You just can't tell. I mean, you can tell if it's a disaster. But, but between kind of mediocre and better, you just can't tell. So what you see with engagement isn't always what you get. And so we're going to dig deeper into engagement for the rest of our time together today. Where does all this engagement stuff and the worry about engagement come from? Well, over the last uh, 10, 15 years, in schools and in the world, we've been dealing with two things. On the left is a thing called germ, and on the right is a thing called VUCA. It's not a foot disease. I'll explain what it is in a second, OK? Germ 
is what my Finnish colleague, Pazi Selberg, calls the global education reform movement. Since the 1980s, since a nation at risk with Ronald Reagan, this is what our world has become like in schools, for you and for the kids. Standardization, scripted teaching, line by line, in literacy. Pick up the pace, follow the pace, don't slow down for everybody. More testing. Some states, every subject, every grade, every year, every child, practically. Does this sound familiar? Accountability, top down, punitive. If, I, if school's not going well, fire the principal. Get rid of some of the teachers, change them over. Competition between schools, even between kids. A more privatization or semi-privatization. A charter schools, a magnet schools before that. I'm not against uh, diversity and choice in schools and I'm d definitely not against uh, charter schools, but a whole movement that starts to pit charter schools against other public schools. And what this makes teachers, and, and we studied this a lot in the last 20 years, what this makes teachers and kids feel like is, is that they've no control. They're being overly controlled all the time. It's a kind of torture, really. They're not in charge. Autonomy is one of the most important things in well-being. And feeling you don't have autonomy is hugely oppressive, whether you're a teacher or whether you're a kid. So this is the first part of it. I'll get on to VUCA in a second. But you can do things about this. You can. It's not hopeless. We collected data in Ontario, in Canada. If you're from Ontario, in Canada, could you raise your hands? Anybody here from Ontario? No, because it's impossible getting across the border and back. That's why, that's why they're not here. Okay. So, in Ontario, we only test in grades three, six, and nine. Uh, English and maths, basically, not in other grades. But even that, and, and we don't fire people because of the results, but the results are published in the papers and they lead to interventions, and the effect is the same as anywhere else. Teaching for the test, narrowing of the curriculum, and one of the most interesting is avoiding innovation in the grades where the tests are. So if the schools get a pro an innovative project, they do it in the grade that's not tested, or even in the grade before that. And a lot of anxiety, and a lot of well-being problems. And you know, for three years, I was one of four advisors to the Premier of Ontario, like the Governor. And as I was collecting this data, we would meet with her periodically, and she'd ask the advisors how it was going. And in one of our meetings, all the other three advisors spoke, and she was with all her, all her other people, including all the deputy ministers, the assistant deputies. And then she said, Andy, what do you think? And I said, well, Premier, you care about well-being, don't you? It's one of your four priorities. She said, yes, I do. She's a lesbian grandmother, so she worries about bullying. She did a master's degree in indigenous languages, so she's worried about native Canadians or First Nations Canadians, as we call them. Very concerned about well-being. I said, you know, I'm concerned about well-being too. And you've been doing some fabulous things in your schools around well-being. Here they are. And I laid them all out. And I said, but there's one issue. The standardized testing system that you inherited, you haven't created it, but you inherited it, is creating perverse, pervasive ill-being in young children. And I believe you are a woman of principle and you don't want that. But I'm telling you that as the premier of this province, you are responsible for large numbers of children experiencing ill-being in schools. And I'm not telling you what to do about that, but I'm asking you, in fact, and at this point, some people started to cry. I said, I'm not asking you, I am begging you 
to take, respond, to take moral responsibility for it. And so she did. And she asked all the advisors, there were six of us by then, uh, with one or two other people, to review the standardized testing system, to make it public, and to recommend changes, one of which was abolishing all standardized testing before grade six. And she accepted the report. Now, two months later, she was voted out of office, not because of the report, but, but her government will come back soon, and that is on the table, and that will be acted upon. We can make a difference at the policy level. Linda Darling-Hammond has abolished all standardized achievement testing in California. This is not just, it, it can't happen here, it does happen here. Several states have done this. And, and you can do something too, even when it's there. So we have one superintendent of a school district up in the north of Canada. Many indigenous students, half are indigenous students. One of the most challenged districts in the whole province. And he stood up in front of all his staff one day who were worried about the test scores and how their kids would score. And he said to them, I do not give a rodent's bottom about the test scores. Actually, he didn't say rodent's bottom. He said something a bit more, a bit more rude than that, okay? I really don't care, he said. The main thing is get these kids learning, get them engaged, get them enjoying school, and get them succeeding. And if we do that, the test scores will look after themselves. Stand up and say that in your schools, and, and your teachers will whoop with joy. You may get fired, but your, teachers, <laughs> but your teachers will whoop with joy, okay? So this is germ. And what's the other thing as well as germ? VUCA. VUCA comes from the business literature. And actually, it's originally a military term. And what is it? In the, about the last 20 years, we've been experiencing more volatility, more uncertainty, more chaos, more ambiguity. How has this manifested itself? Well, here's where mental health is after two years of a pandemic. That is definitely part of VUCA. And there'll be more pandemics coming in the future, I'm sorry to tell you. Big impact on mental health rates, su mental health problems, suicide rates. Climate change. Uh, this is uh, about a month and a half ago, a survey of 10,000 16 to 25 year olds all across the world, including the US. Three quarters are afraid of the future. Three quarters. And 40% are thinking about not having kids because of climate change and everything else. This is a serious issue. Our young people really care about this, really care about it. Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Black Lives Matter, a movement that has gone all around the world, involving people of all colors, trying finally to do something about racial oppression and create racial equity. And who are these three people? What, okay, what do these three people have in common? Okay, so remember I can't hear, so shout out. Money, space. Money, space, okay. And they're all men. Right, so, Half the world's wealth is owned by 26 people, 23 of whom are men, and they pay almost no taxes. Half of our money that we don't have for public education is in the pockets of 26 people. We need to do something in this and other countries about wealth privilege as well as white privilege. They often, not always, they often coincide. But so let's think about wealth privilege. And if this sounds pie in the sky, think. 
You may have Black History Month. I hope you do. You may deal with Asian hate. I hope you do. Do you also teach labour history? Do you collaborate with your local teachers' unions? Do you give high status to vocational education, to the dignity of craft and of working with your hands and with mechanical and robotic technologies? Do you give dignity to the pride and history of labour? Do you know the only identity you have to leave behind in order to succeed is class identity? because it's associated with poverty. And nobody wants to still be in poverty, but now, thankfully, people want to be recognized as black and Hispanic and LGBTQ and, and take pride in their disability, not shame. But the only identity you have to leave behind in order to succeed if it's associated with poverty, because nobody wants to be poor or be seen as poor, is working class, and remember, working class has many colours. So where is that in your curriculum, as well as all the rest? Not instead of, but as well as all the rest. Um, and it's a bit of a sore point, because this is where I come from. Read my memoir in 2020 called Moving, about growing up in a working class uh, community. And by the way, fighting all my relatives about Brexit and immigration and everything else, still relatives and friends and so on. So, how are we responding to this? Well, some of, we're trying to do things. So we're trying to respond to mental health issues. And I want you to think about two movies. So here's the first movie. Do you know Inside Out? Okay, it's a great movie. And we've seen lots of things going on in our schools like Inside Out, naming your emotions in terms of colors. My grandkids do it. I'm feeling a bit yellow today, a bit anxious, a bit silly, okay? Red, angry, annoyed, frustrated. Want to be, don't want to be blue, sad. Want to be green, calm, alert, and learning. And that's what this movie is all about, about how these characters learn to know, to express, and to regulate their emotions. But when we teach our kids emotional regulation, is it good for them or is it good for us? When we want them to calm down and sit down, is it good for them or is it good for us? We want them to be quiet and calm and orderly. Is it good for all kids? Or is it just good for kids who come from families and colours that look like mine? What about the kids who want to be joyous, who want to be raucous, who want to let it rip a bit? What about, there is literature saying, some of the work on emotional regulation is racially biased. I want you to think about that. It's not that the kids shouldn't be regulated, shouldn't calm down sometimes. Of course they should, a lot. And teachers talk about the benefits. But it's not the only way to be. It's not the only way to get them engaged. So go to another movie. Sing 2. Who's watched Sing 2? Okay, we've got nowhere else to go during the pandemic, so we might as well watch Netflix, okay? So Sing 2. At the end of Sing 2, here's one of the songs. And I can't, I can't remember the melody, but it's by a group called The Struts. And what's it saying? It sounds like practically Taylor Swift, okay? Here's, it's about letting your emotions out. If you're going to do something bold, you're going to experience the negative ones as well as the positive ones and learn how to deal with them. You're going to embrace the negative ones. If you're angry about climate change, get angry. We need to get angry. We need to be outraged. Stoke up the anger and then work with it. Use it as a lever. Use it as fuel. Don't try and calm kids down with all the VUCA that's coming at them all the time. So, can you say this about yourselves? I want to taste love and pain. I want to feel pride and shame. You don't want to ever look back and say, could have been me. Could have been me, yeah. You've got to embrace the difficult stuff as well as just calm everybody down and carry on. Are you okay so far? Yeah. All right, good. I can only hear you at the front. The rest might be saying no, but, but that's fortunate. That's good. So, so the priority now is, it is a bit about learning loss. You know, the poor kids have fallen a lot behind the rich kids. The rich kids haven't lost anything during the pandemic. 
They're, they're just where they would have been. The poor kids are way behind, a year or more in some cases. So we do need to think about learning loss, but don't jump from learning loss to thinking, we need to test the kids more. We need more after school. We need more one-on-one -on -one tuition. We need more literacy. We need more math. We need more more. Because one way to deal with learning loss is not by more of the mandated, tested, program, prescriptive stuff, it is about getting the kids engaged and excited about learning and getting their reading back and getting their writing back and getting their maths back through that. Because engagement, remember, is the lever for learning and the window into well-being. It's the new frontier of student achievement. This is where we did the work. I've told you about it, so we will whiz past it now. But remember, a lot of poverty in America and elsewhere is rural. Here's our teachers working together, trying to develop engagement. And here's what the literature tells you. It says there are three kinds. I'd say there's a fourth, even a fifth. Emotional engagement. How you feel? Are you happy? Are you joyous? Are you um, thrilled by what you're doing? Can you not tear yourself away from it? Are you bodily engaged? This is why it's good to get kids to move around and not sit still all the time. Are you cognitively engaged, curious, focusing? Are you all those things? And I'd add spiritual. Are you spiritually engaged? Doesn't mean religious necessarily, but feeling that you're part of something bigger than yourselves. Might be nature, might be a community, might be the society. Are you spiritually engaged as well? Uh, this is the... So we went and read the handbook on research on student engagement. It's the most boring book I've ever read. Okay, it's huge. It's this big. And almost none of it is based on research with actual teachers teaching or kids learning. It's all about brain science or laboratories or meta-analyses of big data. There's not one chapter on poverty and there's nothing about technology. Nothing. We need a different way of thinking about engagement, and that is what the school is doing to enhance or inhibit student engagement. So, here's a little exercise for you. Are you ready? This front row across here, and the third row, so that and then that, would you think about this question here in a minute? Because I'm going to give the other two rows a different question. Okay, so the question is, well, to think about a young person who is often disengaged. What does it look like? How do they behave? What's causing it? Kid you know, a kid you've known, often disengaged. What's behind it? And then the other two rows, so that's the second row and the fourth row. And actually, I realize there's a fifth row now, sort of, back there. You can be anyone you want, okay? So the second row and the fourth row, I want you to think about yourself. So think about a time you've been disengaged, not connected with what's going on. What did it look like? What's the reason for it? How did you deal with it? So you'll need like 30 seconds to a minute to reflect, and then quickly would you share with one person at your table, if the numbers are odd, it might be two more people rather than one. So not as a whole table, but would you share what you're learning? So remember, rows one and three, a student disengaged. Rows two and four, you're disengaged. Row five, pick what you like, okay? And I'm gonna give you about four minutes for this. So two minutes each thinking about either a student or yourself, then I'll tell you what to do next, okay? Where you go. Okay, so. As far as you were able now, we've had two kinds of conversations going on. We've had one about what makes kids disengaged and another about what makes you disengaged or people like you. 
what I'm going to ask you to do now is pair up this way with somebody from the row next to you. So you've got one of you who's been talking about what makes kids disengage, one of you talking about really what makes the adults like you disengaged. And without going into detail, just, just share between you for the next two or three minutes, what are the similarities and differences in what you're finding? So any similarities or differences in what you're finding? So, you know, keep your masks on, uh, keep a reasonable difference, distance, but find somebody in, in the row next to you to have this conversation with. Thank you. Okay, stay right where you are, if you would. Stay right where you are. Uh, Mark Schellinger is going to come around with a microphone, for those of you who are bold enough. Uh, but, but any of you who saw a lot of similarities in the adult and the student's experience of disengagement, could you raise your hands? Could you raise your hands? Don't, don't be afraid. Or uh, I know you know you're going to have to talk if you do that, so you probably ooh, don't really want to do that. But somebody who raised their hand and is prepared to say something about what's similar. Mark? We, we talked about how the engagement piece is you have to take responsibility for it, whether it's a student, whether it's an adult and how you have to be actively engaged in something and you make that choice. And that can be very difficult for students to do, yeah. but it also can be very difficult for adults to do. That, that is a fantastic point, which is there's a double responsibility, which is what is my responsibility to get engaged, kind of make a bit of an effort here, and, and what, is, what is other people's responsibility to make it easier for you to get to get engaged. So and Andy, we important. microphones on both sides of the rooms. Jim Mercer, there's Kent. Yeah, okay, let's take another one, and then we'll take two of the opposite view, yeah. And so in looking at that disengagement as a teacher versus living it myself, it's searching for, as a teacher, searching for the understandings behind the behavior of disengagement and not just presuming yeah. that it's laziness, yeah. that it's you know going with my assumption, but spending time to find out what might this be about. So, so very good. You'll, you'll not be able to gauge uh, engagement or disengagement by a quick observation or a quick walkthrough, other than very superficially. You, you actually need to build a relationship with the teacher, with the, with the, with the kids, with the students to understand what what is what what you're seeing mean, what it actually means, and then to understand what it is that, that's behind that. Thank you. Anybody see any differences between the two? Any differences between the two that you want to talk about? Uh, yeah, this gentleman over here. Thank you. And we've had three men so far. I just thought I'd mention that. I, I no, can talk no, with a high no, voice. No pressure, helps. no pressure, anybody. But okay. three men. Okay, go on. Three musketeers. Uh, to me, a big difference is when I am disengaged. I am typically in a situation I chose to be in. Yeah. As an adult, whether it's a marriage, whether it's a relationship, whether it's my job, whether yeah. it's the group I belong to, our students don't always get those choices. Yeah. I had to be in fourth period English no matter what. Yeah. And so I think that's a, a difference that we have to be cognizant of. So, so the same, you know, some of that is like who's in charge. And, and I do a lot of work. I advise the, uh, effectively the Prime Minister of Scotland. Uh, so, you know, I'm one of her advisors. And, and I can go to almost any school in Scotland and talk to any child of any age. And if I ask them this question, they will know how to answer it. Two questions. What are you learning? And why are you learning it? Very simple. What are you learning? Why are you learning it? And, 
And, and, and that has to be more than, I, I need this to get to college. It has to be something like, what is the purpose of what it is that, that you're learning? Thank you. Yeah. And one more? Yeah. I think some of the differences also um, re rely on us including all stakeholders because parents have different experiences, different priorities, different beliefs. And when you mentioned the piece about, um, you know, wealthier kids making it through the pandemic, you know, I'm a parent of a child who is now taking honors classes. I'm a principal in a school where yeah. we're filling gaps. And I have noticed that some of the conversations with the parents have, um, there, I have students that can't go home and get the extra help. Yeah. Um, I have students whose parents can't afford to throw them yeah. in a thousand dollar dance program yeah. in the middle of a pandemic, yeah. you know, all of those pieces. So we also, in getting to know, going back to this morning, the core of our students, yeah. we have to have those relationships with the parents because I have even had to have a conversation to convince yeah. a parent yeah. to keep their child in school yeah. and not just throw them on um, yeah. a free public remote school yeah. There's still no supervision, and we walked through that together yeah. with so, the child. So we have to continue yeah. to engage parents it's, yeah. it's, so that it's, we're supporting kids. It's, it's, not a living, it's not a level playing field, is it? It's just not a level playing field. And uh, yeah, so, so just one more after this, yeah. but I just want to feed back on that, which is, you know, you know Angela Duckworth's grit? Yes. Yeah. So I'm not against grit. I needed a lot of it when I grew up because my dad died when I was 12. Um, my mother had three jobs, all working class jobs. And then she got very sick. And at the age of 14, I realized I was in charge of her. She wasn't in charge of me. And I never got to school till uh, 11 o'clock in the morning. I missed all my maths classes. And it, it took me two goals to get into college. I didn't get in the first time. So uh, I, I know that, that, that you need a lot of things, but you need a bit of grit as well. But the truth is, is the tougher your background, the more you need something else as well as grit. The, the, the more you need parents and other people to be supporting you, getting you motivated, excited, interested, involved. Grit is good, but grit is not enough. You need other things besides. One more. Uh, we just talked about the question, what did it look like? And the differences were that the children didn't know how to be sneaky about being disengaged like the adults do. Yeah, so, sorry, could you just say that one more time? The children are not as sneaky and don't know how to be as sneaky about being disengaged like adults do. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so we've got a lot to learn from each other, basically, when we speak to each other. Thanks very much indeed. Please resume your seats, all of you. So, here's the deal. Uh, in the book, we talk about five psychological theories of engagement that are kind of abroad in schools a lot. Things like mindfulness, things like growth mindsets. You'll have heard of all of these, okay? Things like emotional regulation. Uh, here's one of them. Two of them, actually. This is Harry Harlow, 1940s, who invented the concept of intrinsic motivation when he set puzzles for monkeys. And he was trying to figure out what rewards would get them to solve the puzzles. And then he found a weird thing. The rewards made no difference. What made the difference was how interesting the puzzles were. And that was, that's where we get the concept of intrinsic motivation from Harry, Harry Harlow in the 1940s. Of course, Daniel Pink has made it more popular. Question is, is how often, how much do you get your kids engaged by grades, stars, pizza vouchers, praise? And how often do you get them engaged by the inherent interest of the work that they're doing and how they're doing it? Or Mikhail Shimahaili's work on flow. Flow means, flow means you're so absorbed in something, you lose all track of time. You don't think about sleep, food, 
anything because you've lost all sense of what's going around you because learning this thing you're learning is so all engrossing. How often do you experience flow? Because flow happens when you're at the very limits of your capability right now until you stretch it further. But in something you really want to do, something you really want to do, and you're at the very limits of your capability. How often do you get your kids? You can't be in flow all the time. If you're in flow all the time, you'll drown, right? But, but we all need experiences of flow like once or twice a week, at least once or twice a month. How often do you get your kids experiencing like they've totally lost what's going on around them? Rather than praise and pizza vouchers and test scores and stars. Two things to think about. So, the last thing is this. I believe that all of you know how to get intrinsic motivation. All of you know how to get kids in a feeling of flow. All of you know how to get your kids engaged. Teachers don't go into teaching to turn the light bulbs off. Right? We care and we know what we want to do. But there is stuff stopping us. And we need to look at it, face it, and deal with it. And here are the last five things to think about when you go away. One, when your kids are disengaged, are they really disenchanted? Has the magic gone? Young kids get a lot of magic. Do you keep the magic like those math teachers with their, with their metal boxes? Like the teacher I know in New Brunswick who turned his whole class into Hogwarts Hall for a week with all the teachers wearing Hogwarts Hall Harry Potter costumes. What happens to the magic? Who has stolen it from us? Testing. Standardization, prescription, pizza vouchers, stars, praise. That is what has stolen it from us. How do we get the magic back? Second is disconnection. You don't know what you're studying, and you definitely don't know why you're studying it, apart from it's there. It's like a random thing that falls out of the sky in the curriculum for you. We don't like, as teachers, things falling out of the sky that we're told what to do. And kids don't either, even when they're really well meant. So what meaning and purpose do you have? Do you connect your kids? How do you connect your kids with climate change? It doesn't mean science projects. It means from when they're very young, how do you get them in nature? How do you get them learning outdoors as well as indoors? The province of Nova Scotia, as a result of working with us, this last year spent $9 million on making sure every elementary school has an outdoor learning space. Not playing space, an outdoor learning space. Because the results on kids of being outside with rough surfaces with each other and in nature with adults are overwhelmingly positive. And when I presented a keynote to ASCD last week about this, somebody said, but you know, there's loads of money for technology. Where's the money for this going to come from? I said, you don't need any. Open the door. It's free. It's free. Ken Robinson said, kids spend in schools less time outside than prisoners in the Shawshank Redemption. Let's think about all the ways we can get them outside more. Three to go. We're almost there. Okay. Third. Third. The um, Wall Street Journal did a piece a couple of years ago. School shootings, who does them? Who does them? You know, when they find out who did them, they don't say, oh, this is a really popular kid, loads of friends, really got on well with everybody, was like a shining light in the community. No, who are they? They're lonely. They're bullied. They connect with anybody online. If they connect with anybody, they connect online. And they, by the way, have algorithms that reinforce your prejudices. So if you search for this, 
Google tells you to search for something like it, and pretty soon you hate everybody. So attachment, belonging, very important. How do you do that in the school? With the band, with sports, we're good at that. But how do you do that in the class? And how do you belong to kids who are not like you as well as kids who are? If you've got no color in your school other than white, how do you connect with kids in other schools where there is color? And what can you learn from each other by doing that? About networking schools together. We learn more from people who are different than ones who are the same. Fourth, disempowerment. That's the voice and involvement thing, which is how can I self-determine my learning? What autonomy do I have? Which projects do I choose? How do I follow my interests? How do I follow the interests that you inspire in me? What space and time and encouragement do I have for that? And last but not least, I'm going to show you this. There's a whole section on it in the book. Look at that. How many hours a day are you spending on your smartphone? In including a lot of tables who've been on their smartphones right now. So as soon as I say that, my valuations are going way down for this session. Okay? Because you're on your smartphones and you shouldn't be. Because they're an addiction. The answer is about 4.8 hours a day. You want the kids to get off TikTok? You want the, uh, don't just say, we're going to ban those devices, but we stay on them. We look at them when we're at our desk in class while they're doing something else. We look at our smartphone while the kids are playing in the play park. We look at our smartphone while we're in Starbucks picking up our coffee. We stick an iPad in front of our kids. Who are we as models for our kids if we're on our smartphones all the time? And how, when we talk about this in the book, do we develop an ethical technology charter that manages these risks in our schools? And Andy, I don't want to be a distraction, but we agree with him, don't we? Yeah. So and I want to thank everyone, and I'm, I want to thank you, we Andy. Okay. We are done. You, we, are we, done. we have to be, because otherwise the distraction is going to be starvation. Okay. And they are looking forward to lunch, but they also thoroughly enjoyed you. Can we give Andy Hargraves a round thank of applause? You. And a standing ovation, too. Look at that, Andy. Okay. And they're not walking to lunch yet. They're saying, we like you, Andy, and we're glad you were willing to come and do this session. Okay. We greatly appreciate it.